Thank you for introducing me and uh, thank you for giving me a chance of uh, giving this talk. And uh, some of you already um, know that I'm doing a lot of weird things, including displacement noise free interferometer, 100 megahertz gravitational wave detection, and the radiation pressure noise of, uh, reduction. But I hope this is the least weird thing, <laughs> or not. <laughs> So what is DeSigo? Uh, so DeSigo stands for Deschelt Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. I'm not sure whether this Deschelt is legal term or not, but it means 0.1 hertz. And oh, this is uh, the, the goal sensitivity of ESA, and uh, this is the goal sensitivity of some second generation terrestrial detectors, such as uh, this, this particular one is for LCGT, but Advanced LIGO and the Advanced Virgo uh, have kind of similar uh, goal sensitivity. And this LIGO will bridge the gap between the LISA and the terrestrial detector, uh, the frequency band. And uh, <clears throat> so this is good because it can detect uh, in spirals, uh, which moves above the LISA band. Uh, and also the inspirals, uh, inspiral signals, which will move into terrestrial detector band. So this can be used as a, a kind of follow-up for uh, LISA and uh, 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 predictor for terrestrial detectors. And what is good with this in this band is that uh, there's the confusion limiting noise is very small here, very low. Uh, limiting noise is. Um, the, the result of you know, too many uh, white dwarf, white dwarf uh, uh, binaries in our galaxy. And there, there are so many uh, binaries, so we cannot distinguish them. In, uh, there are more than uh, two uh, sources. Uh, the gravitational in one band, there are more than two sources, so we cannot uh, distinguish them. But white dwarf is pretty big, so it does not. The, the spiral frequency cannot go beyond 0.1 hertz. So we have very good uh, deep window here. Uh, this is the pre-conceptual design of this IGO. Uh, we use differential fabrital interferometer. This is uh, similar to the old 40 meter uh, prototype of Caltech, if you, some of you rem still remember. Um, Laser. The, we have three spacecraft, and uh, laser is here. The, the laser light is divide, divided into two uh, beams by this beam splitter, and it, they enter the Fabry-Perot arm cavity. And uh, the the light uh, returned. The, the the light reflected from the Fabry-Perot cavity is detected by the detector, and we can use the common mode signal to stabilize the, la the laser, and we get the signal in the differential signal of these two. Uh, <coughs> and we have one. Uh, this is one interferometer, and the arm length between here and here is only 1,000 kilometers instead of five million kilometer for LISA, much shorter because we have to use, we have to do fabry arm cavity. It cannot be very uh, long. And we have to uh, use pretty big mirror, like one meter, to get all the light. And the wavelength, the, this is green, uh, because green, uh, the infrared diverges more than green. And with these optical parameters, we can attain a finesse of 10 for this fabry arm cavity. And we use a laser power of 10 watt. And the mirror mass is 100 kilogram. It's pretty heavy. Uh, we need that to reduce the radiation pressure noise. And those drug-free satellite, uh, satellite uh, we use a drug-free satellite. Um, is a, um, I think you are familiar with drug-free satellite, but let me just briefly explain. So we have two satellites, and we want to measure the distance between the two satellites. Uh, but the you know satellites get force from the the solar pressure and the dust, so they uh, their motion is um, not purely uh, following the gravitational field. 
So we have some um, the something inside which we call proof mass and uh, cover the cover that pr uh, proof mass by the satellite, and then we measure the relative uh, position uh, between that the proof mass and the satellite, and we control the position of the satellite so that uh, this proof mass is always in the center of the satellite. That's uh, that's what we call drug-free satellite. And in this case, we use these two mirrors as, as proof masses. Uh, and this is, as I said, this is the one interferometer, and this is another, and this is the third one. And the, the, the three interferometers share the two mirrors, uh, the mirrors. And this one set of uh, the detector is called uh, one cluster. And let me explain why we uh, decided to uh, use Fabry-Ferro cavity instead of uh, transponder type uh, configuration like uh, LISA. So let me, um, this is a sensitivity curve, frequency, strain, and this is quantum noise, uh, shot noise, and radiation pressure noise. Uh, uh, let, let me start with uh, the transponder type uh, detector. The, the light diverges like that, so this detector, the you know the end satellite can detect only a fraction of the uh, light here. Anyway, the shot noise is white, and the this goes up above the corner frequency, which is determined by the length of this uh, the arm length, uh, because above this frequency, gravitational wave, wave signal cancels cancel because uh, the gravitational wave uh, change changes its uh, polarity uh, before the light propagates back to this uh, anyway. So it goes up. And radiation pressure noise in terms of force is white. And so it has a, a frequency dependence of f to the minus 2 in terms of uh, strain. So it's Something like this. So now, I will shorten the arm length uh, so that this mirror can catch all the light. And what happens to the, uh, the quantum noise? This short noise part uh, doesn't change. It looks strange, but uh, the arm length is short, so that's not good but you get more light. So the two effects cancel exactly. So this short noise part is the same. And this corner frequency goes up. Uh, I, I assume that uh, this length is 1,000 times shorter than this one. So this corner frequency goes up in frequency by a factor of 1,000. Because this corner frequency just uh, depends on the, the length arm length. And this radiation pressure noise goes up by a factor of 10 to the 6, because first it's short, that's not good, and you get more light, that's not good. So double effect. Uh, so it goes up by a factor of 10 to the 6. But since this has a dependence of f to the minus 2, this moves this way uh, by a factor of 1,000. So as a result, this shape is same and just shifts this way in, in this log log logarithmic log log, log figure. Interesting. <laughs> and now we have all the light, so we can implement a fabric pair cavity and assume that we have um, uh, finesse of 10, something like something like 10. So this short noise can be improved by a factor of 10, and this part is same because you know the uh, this is just a, due to uh, gravitational wave signal cancellation. So it's same, and radiation pressure noise goes up by a factor of 10 because uh, they are um, correlating. So anyway, um, 
So as a result, from this, from here to here, from this green to red, you can improve the best, the, the best sensitivity. And you lose the bandwidth with a little bit. And you shift the frequency from low to high. So this is uh, this part. This is why we chose uh, fabric pearl cavity. Can they ask a question any time? No, sure. Let's answer the two frequencies where the curve turns at the bottom. This is just a general discussion. So is the radiation pressure really the dominant noise at low frequency? Because these are well, normally, you know, uh, position. I <laughs> Yeah, here, you know, I, I ignore all the practical noises, only quantum noise. And for Lisa, of course, uh, practical noise is limiting here. So radiation pressure noise is hidden under the practical noise. And uh, I, um, as I will uh, mention uh, later, the silo sensitivity will be, should be limited by radiation pressure noise. It's much harder. But anyway, in principle, it's, you know, if you can, re if you, can remove all the practical noise. You can do the, this discussion is uh, uh, legitimate. So now, um, so when I say that we're going to use uh, fabric pearl cavity, many people are wondering um, as, uh, um, whether the fabric pearl cavity and drug-free uh, satellite are compatible. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to imagine, but I'll show you uh, that uh, they are compatible using this animation. So first, uh, this, uh, we have two satellites and two mirrors, just to simplify the situation. And first, uh, <laughs> the two mirrors are moving according to the uh, gravitational wave yeah, sorry, gravitational field uh, in this, these mirrors. And spacecrafts also follows the gravitation, uh, gravitational fields as well as uh, radiation pressure, uh, solar radiation pressure, and drag, or et cetera. Now, we measure the relative position of this mirror to the satellite uh, with respect to the satellite and control the, the position of the satellite using this thruster to attach it to this satellite. So now, uh, <coughs> this satellite uh, is following the motion of this mirror. And same thing here. The, this uh, satellite is following the motion of this mirror. But still, those two mirrors are moving independently. So the distance between the two mirrors are not uh, fluctuating. And then we measure the distance between the two mirrors using this interferometer. And uh, this signal is fed back to this actuator to control this mirror. So now this mirror is following the motion of this mirror. So this mirror is a leader, and everybody else is following uh, this mirror. And um, you can see on um, this local sensor output, this one is very dirty because the spacecraft shakes, uh, moves according uh, uh, with uh, uh, solar radiation or drug. So this signal is dirty. And this, is, this signal uh, detects the distance between the two mirrors. So it, it, it should contain gravitational wave signal. And the point is that this dirty signal is not uh, the it, it doesn't come into this clean signal, so we are fine. This signal is good, and this dirty signal uh, cannot impair uh, this good signal. So they are compatible. But then, when the that signal then the, the thruster actuates on the spacecraft. Right. And any coupling between the spacecraft and the mirror will then contaminate the interferometer signal. You mean, um, for example, the gravitational field caused by this uh, spacecraft 
acting on. No, the, the mirror is physically on the spacecraft, and if it's coupled to the spacecraft in any way. Oh, they are flo floating. As long as that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I should mention that. Um, so the two mirrors are floating. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So Yeah, uh in principle now, you know, there's the mirror this mirror should be free from any kind of noise, but in reality it's not the case. For example, just the, the gravitational field caused by this space, spacecraft uh affects the motion of this mirror. Uh, that's what you said. Yeah. So we have to Somehow, um, the, um, <clears throat> how can I say? The, we, we have a lot of requirement for to avoid that noise. So, for example, the <clears throat> the relative position, uh, relative displacement of the mirror, I mean the the spacecraft with respect to the mirror, should be less than like uh, 10 to the minus 9 meters per terahertz at uh, the frequency uh, interesting frequency band or something like that. We have a lot of constraints. Can I ask you one more? Sorry. So you're, you're treating one mirror so that it follows the other one? Uh, in this case, yeah. But, but don't you lose a gravitational wave signal if you do that? You need to actuate out of band. Is that the point? Or? That's fine. Um, well, you know, the if this is inbound uh, feed of feedback servo, gravitational wave signal appears here. And if, I mean, here. And if this is, well, in any case, I, you, you get signal here. <laughs> it's the same as LIGO. In your noise curve from the previous slide, um, is there any, now that you've got a fabric row, is there any contribution from test mass thermal noise? Or is it just? For this LIGO, yeah, um, we calculated, and it's barely OK. And that is making some assumptions about the material and the coatings. At low frequencies, it's much larger than in LIGO, right? But it's still not a concern to you. This, this you are talking about the internal mode. In yeah, test mass thermal mode, but also the thermal mode of noise and the, and the coatings. Sure, yeah. But uh, the slope, it's not that steep. <laughs> I think your beam okay. is also okay. bigger and uh, the yeah. arm is much bigger. Also longer. So all these things working. Yeah. Okay. How do you acquire hmm? How do you acquire law? <laughs> well, quite yeah, quite challenging. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is an orbit and a constellation. We, pl uh, we plan to place uh, one, two, three, four clusters uh, around the sun in, uh, in the Earth trail orbit. And this is uh, the record disk orbit so that this triangle is maintained always. Uh, we need this separation to increase the angular resolution of the source of a source. And also we place, we need two uh, clusters here at the same place to take some correlation data for stochastic background research anal analysis. And does this tumble like this? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's called the record, record disk orbit or something. <laughs> How far apart are those two disks? Here? Well, um, in principle, I, I, <laughs> I, I wanted to mention this one later because it's an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah, please wait. In principle, on one plane, on the same plane. OK, this is a, a goal sensitivity of the Saigo, uh, the Saigo and uh, also science obtained by the Saigo. So This is a frequency and uh, strain, sensitive strain. And this green curve is the Goal sensitivity, goal sensitivity of the cycle. 
and this part is shot noise, and this part is radiation pressure noise. Uh, <coughs> and first, uh, the black hole binaries. This is a uh, uh, black hole binary uh, coalescence. 1,000 solar mass and at z of 1. And the, this, this is coalescence. So you can see huge signal to noise ratio. So we can detect all the uh, black hole binary spirals from um, all, all, the, all, all the universe, a lot. So we can um, take some data and do some statistics and to uh, reveal uh, the, the mechanism of formation of supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. So we can do this. And uh, this is neutron star binary uh, in spiral of at z of 1. We can start seeing that uh, five years before coalescence. And we expect that we see like gravitational waves coming from like uh, 100,000, I forgot the number, but 100,000 sources at the same time or something like that, a lot. And uh, oops. Uh, so this, if, uh, if we analyze the waveform of the gravitational wave signals coming from these uh, sources, we can uh, directly measure the acceleration of the universe. Uh, let me explain, explain. So this is neutron star, neutron star coalescence, the uh, in spiral, and uh, the cyber is detecting gravitational waves coming from that. And since the universe is expanding, uh, the signal is red shifted, and this black one is the template uh, which we would expect um, for ordinary red shift red shifted gravitational wave signal. But if this expansion is accelerating, we get some phase delay. Uh, so this is like a one second if we observe this signal for 10 years. So we can measure it. So we can use this as a direct acceleration measurement of the universe, the expansion of the universe. So that's good. And also, we can do the similar thing to that the supernova observation. Like, uh, if we um, measure, if we analyze this waveform carefully, we can detect the, the distance uh, between this and here. And if we can find the uh, host galaxy of this uh, neutron star, neutron star binary, we can measure the red shift uh, using that host galaxy something. And then we can also do, you know, the uh, uh, relate. We can measure the relationship of uh, between the distance and the redshift. Are those um, big ifs, or are those things that you think you could really do? I mean, for example, in order to locate the source galaxy, you need enough angular resolution to find the source galaxy. And then to measure the distance, you need to know the absolute amplitude, mm. right, I guess. And to know the absolute amplitude, you need to know whether you're seeing the, the source head on, you know. You need to know the I think, angle. I think we can calculate that without any ambiguity. Is that right? Well, <laughs> I mean, I, it on some of them, How many linear resolution? Uh, how many I, I think uh, if we have, you know, th those three clusters, um, the angular resolution we can get is something like one arc second. Really? Yeah. Good. good. So we <laughs> probably uh, kind of, yeah, or 0.1. <laughs> arc second. Yeah. Wow. So why baseline? You're observing it for a year or two. Yeah. yeah. So uh, probably we can do that. Uh, this is the frequency. That's frequency. Oh yes, I see. Okay. A question on the the black hole batteries. Is a very large signal to noise for redshift one, or if you're interested in redshift fifteen or so, are you still? 
Uh, well, I'm not. Do you know? Actually, this is a problem for the next topic. <laughs> so I will mention that in 10 seconds. <laughs> OK, so next one is the, <coughs> um, so we have, we have two clusters on, the, on one plane. And if we take a correlation data for three years, we can attain this red curve uh, sensitivity. And then this is good enough to measure to detect uh, gravitational waves coming from the, the inflation period. Uh, like, I forgot to write the omega GW, but omega GW, this line is 2 times 10 to the minus 16. So it's a kind of standard uh, number. So we can detect that. But as you mentioned, we have a lot of neutron star, neutron star binary signals here. So we have to remove one by one. <laughs> and in principle, it's possible, because uh, unlike the confusion limiting noise, uh, we have less than one source in one bin. So we are able to remove that. But uh, it's a tough job. <laughs> OK, so. Um, So, um, so five minutes ago, you asked uh, the separation. And as, as I said, for standard configuration, they should be on one plane. But if you make a little bit distance between the two uh, clusters, you can do something interesting. Because if you have two detectors like that, you are the detector is sensitive to uh, the rotation of gravitational waves. So you can distinguish right-handed gravitational waves from left-handed gravitational waves. So you can measure some kind of asymmetry the, yeah, in, in the beginning of the universe. That would be amazingly interesting if we can measure that. And if we uh, make good separation, you are still very, you are still, you know, sensitive to this ordinary uh, signal, and you get pretty good si uh, sensitivity to that uh, rotation, gravitational wave. And, and this effect is also tumbling, just like the others. So it's yeah. scanning the sky in some sense. And you could actually do uh, some radiometry and locate any directionality mm -hmm. of, uh, of the cosmic background. Yeah. Requirements. Uh, require if I write all the requirements, that would be like ten pages. So I just <laughs> simplified that. Um, acceleration noise. I don't know why they call acceleration noise, but uh, in Lisa, Lisa people call that acceleration noise. And uh, in LIGO, we do we still call that displacement noise? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> displacement noise. Uh, so, okay. So acceleration, any, all the practical acceleration noise should be suppressed below ra uh, radiation pressure noise, which is very tough. Uh, and very simply, uh, the, the noise in terms, the force noise of, uh, force noise requirement for this cycle is 50 times uh, more stringent than that of this. 
Um, Decigo is not competing with Lisa, but uh, Decigo is something after Lisa. So I think 50 is not outrageous number. No, I mean different frequency. So higher frequency, so probably easier. <laughs> but usually false noise is white. <laughs> uh, I, I won't explain. The face noise, the sensor noise should be also, any practical sensor noise should be suppressed below soft noise. And face noise for the, si the requirement of face noise for DeSigo is uh, 10 times looser than that of LCGT or advanced LIGO. So 10 times loose, loose, uh, looser, but in space, you know, I'm not sure. But is it? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, the, the sensor noise in terms of strain uh, for DeSigo is almost the same as that of uh, terrestrial detectors. And we have a storage time. Storage time is different by a factor of 10, so this results in this sensor uh, phase noise difference. So this would be the subject of your laser, basically, right? Phase noise, uh, what, what number? Uh, what's the number? Phase noise? <laughs> yeah. So for Lisa, it's what, 1 in 10 to 15. Is that the sense no, sense, uh, phase noise? Uh, Okay, if it, that's the face noise, that's that's it. Yeah. No, no, but what's that? Oh, the. What, what it be here? Uh, well, if somebody remembers the face noise of uh, the once LIGO, it's ten times. You're stabilizing, you're stabilizing with the common mode, <coughs> but you're measuring a very low frequency. Same thing. These are two, two different things. You're talking about laser face noise. We don't step. We don't. No. But this is uh, differential phase noise. Because they have a common mode server, yeah. which squashes it as hard as you can go. But that's shot noise limit to the common mode server that factors into your design. Hmm. Okay. So the very roadmap, this is very challenging. We plan to launch the Cycle Pathfinder in 2012, and six year uh, the the Cycle Pathfinder we um, we test. Uh, key technologies, and we do some observation run. And this is just one spacecraft, one arm, one orbital arm cavity. And six years later, launch free the cycle. Sorry, and the Pathfinder is an orbit around the sun, or the Earth? I will explain later. Uh, <clears throat> and this free the cycle uh, should detect gravitational waves uh, uh, with some minimum specification. And we test the orbital cavity between spacecraft. And we just have one, um, one interferometer. And then this cycle, 2024. Uh, this is um, very, how can I say, very difficult, probably. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I consulted with the director of uh, ISAS. ISAS is uh, kind, of, um, kind of NASA in Japan. And he said, I asked him, how many years should I you know, make it, uh, between each step? And he said, six. So I just. I don't know. <laughs> just total overall. <laughs> So DeSigo Pathfinder, um, this is DeSigo. We take um, actually this part and shrink this 1,000 kilometer arm length to 20 centimeter and put everything in one spacecraft. So laser and Fabripero cavity, the mirrors are floating and drug-free satellite. That's a DPF. And uh, 
this is just a little bit more detail. Uh, we have uh, actuator. We need actuator to control the this mirror, and we also uh, some sensor to uh, do the drug-free system, and we need some kind of stabilization laser stabilization system. So we will test drug-free control system, laser source and stabilization system, and control of fabric pillow interferometer. And this launch lock system is the, those two mirrors are floating. So we have to clamp them when we launch. And then uh, in space, we have to release them uh, very gently. So this is a launch lock, launch lock system. Um, sorry. Um, so just as in Lisa, you have two, um, in the you have two proof masks. And they're pointing at the And surely if they're moving with respect to one another, Screwed, I guess, or you have to stop that. Um, and I, I, I don't understand how Lisa does it, and I don't understand how you would do it, but I'm sure there's a way. But in order to test that, wouldn't it be interesting if your Pathfinder had a full pair of fabric pros? Actually, we are discussing that. But the default plan is just, uh, just one fabric pair. Because first, we, th uh, we thought that this, um, this is very small. But now we have a little bit more space. So we might be able to put uh, the second uh, arm. But we are discussing that. Not yet. Yeah, I will explain that later. Uh, next door, next, next. So this is a goal sensitivity of the cycle pathfinder. Uh, since we have only one arm, the sensitivity is limited by the laser frequency noise, like this. So that's that. And the Cycle Pathfinder can still detect gravitational waves coming from some <laughs> uh, like very heavy black holes uh, in spirals if they occur in, uh, in our galaxy, which is very rare. <laughs> is that one hour? Sorry? Only one hour? Yeah. So how does it, what's the measurement against? We, we stabilize the laser. Against a, a fixed cavity, is that right? Uh, we, are, we are discussing whether we should use a fixed cavity or iodine cell. We, we are still... So that would be the reference. That would be the limiting factor for us. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, the cycle pathfinder. So... This is a payload part, and it's a nine, 90 centimeter cube, and 100 kilogram, and uh, 200 watt power. Uh, so not so bad. Um, small, but. What is the power of the laser? The something like 20 milliwatt or something. I, I think it's, uh, yeah, something like that. This is a bus, and the same uh, size, and a little bit heavier. But anyway, so this is like a bus plus payload. And we, um, our target launch date is still 2012. And I will explain why uh, but later. And mission lifetime, one year. And launch ups. <laughs> Single launch by Mu5 follow on. Uh, this is a solid rocket booster under development. And the orbit is low Earth. Altitude is 500 kilometer. Oops. <laughs> Something like this. And the sun synchronous orbit. So sun is around here. And we control the attitude uh, uh, using just the gravity gradient stabilization, so self stabilization. Oops. <coughs> yeah. Oh, that's a, one satellite has two mirrors. How big are the masses in this? I think it's here. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe 10 centimeter or so. Or, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, 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 the final thing, the one meter, 
Yeah. So this is detail. Um, not much to say about this. Uh, we plan to use just the infrared because just making green is a little bit too much for DPF. And uh, finesse is 100 instead of 10 because I don't know, <laughs> just to improve the sensitivity. And the, no, actually it doesn't. Forget. <laughs> uh, the length is 20 centimeter, test mass one kilogram. Okay. So JAXA, uh, JAXA ISAS, uh, that's a Japanese NASA, uh, is, uh, has been developing a small, sat small science satellite series just to lower the threshold for going into space because, you know, it costs too much, so they just uh, decided to make some, some cheap mission. Cheap, but uh, still $60 million or so. And they plan to launch three uh, small science satellites uh, during uh, five years, starting from 2011. And the first mission was already selected to be TOPS. That's a pl uh, planetary science mission. And, um, oops, what? 15 missions were selected as candidates, and they selected five important candidates. And surprisingly, the Saigo Pathfinder was selected as one of the five important candidate, mission candidates. Uh, and this five includes this. So they are, they are launching three, and uh, excluding this, they are launching two more. And uh, now there are four important candidates, uh, which includes the Saigo Pathfinder. <coughs> Pretty good. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, uh, this is just a history. And uh, <coughs> so we have to submit a phase A proposal uh, very soon, <laughs> this year, by the end of this year. So we have to demonstrate a lot of things. But uh, so we are not in an extremely um, good uh, mode or good shape. But the other missions are also not in a <laughs> good shape. So I think we have a chance. Do you have a ring in space? Qualified for space? Qualified laser? Yeah, the space qualified laser costs one million dollars. <laughs> it's expensive. Pretty cycle. Uh, just uh, the arm length of pretty cycle is 100 kilometer instead of 1,000 kilometer, and my mirror diameter 30 centimeter instead of one meter for the cycle. So all spec down and still. So this, this is the sensitivity of pretty cycle compared with this desire sensitivity. And we can still uh, detect like uh, Newton star, Newton star coalescence at uh, 300 megaparsec with a signal to noise ratio of 14. So we detect 10 to 20, maybe more events per year. So this is an interim, interim organization of uh, Desigo. So I'm leading the whole thing. And Ando of the University of Tokyo is deputy. And this is just a design phase organization. We are just still, you know, working on design. And this is pretty Saigo. And the Saigo Pathfinder is led by Ando. And we have uh, seven subsystems. And you can see that uh, people from ISAS are taking care of some of the sub subsystems. And this is the Saigo working group, more than 100 one, uh, 130 or 140 people. But you can guess that uh, some of them are ghost members. <laughs> but I hope that the Desigo Pathfinder is approved. They become alive. Uh, at present, no.
Yeah, since some there are many Japanese people who are working abroad, but <laughs> uh, and we will have the first international Lisa Disciple workshop on uh, November 12th and 13th, very soon, at Aizas, Sagamihara, Japan. So objectives, mutual understanding, possible collaboration, discussion, and uh, uh, exposure of the missions to people in the neighboring fields. But, um, <coughs> the, the reason why um, this came up it was that I attended the, the Lisa Symposium last month, and then I talked with Carl Sten, Dansman, and Stefano Vital, and many people, Lisa. And then uh, we discussed uh, the possible collaboration, et cetera, et cetera. And they were impressed by the fact that the Disciple Pathfinder was selected as one of the five uh, candidates. And they uh, suggested that we should uh, have a joint workshop to boost the chance of uh, Disciple being selected as uh, the, the second or third mission. So that's very nice of them. So we. So we started this just uh, three or three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and then the first circular with the web page will be ready in a few days already, very soon. So I hope if you are interested, please, I will circulate all the, the circulation uh, to you. So summary, so Decigo can detect gravitational waves from the inflation, as well as it can bring us extremely interesting science. And DPF has been selected as uh, one of the five important mission candidates for small science satellite series. And they plan to launch three missions in five years, starting from 2011. So let DPF fly. <laughs> Thank you.